The following program is a UWTV classic. University of Washington in Seattle, Upon Reflection. Hello and welcome to Upon Reflection. I'm Marcia Alvar. Over the last year, astronomers have gotten their first look at dozens of ancient galaxies, some so distant that their light has spent most of the universe's history traveling to Earth. Bruce Margon chairs the nonprofit corporation that operates telescopes and astronomy facilities around the globe as well as the Hubble Space Telescope, which he helped design. A professor of astronomy and adjunct professor of physics at the University of Washington, Margon is also involved in a project to create the first ever digital map of the universe. Welcome to Upon Reflection. Thank you. I wanted to begin with what it is you do, because that was the first great surprise that I got when I began planning for this interview. I guess I was sort of locked into an old romantic idea of what an astronomer is and does? Well, first of all, of course, I teach astronomy, and uh, <laughs> that's in some sense my, my first duty and my first joy, but also I do research in astronomy. And you're right, most people think about astronomers as peering through telescopes, but uh, it's not the case anymore, both because a very tremendous, substantial amount of astronomy is not done using traditional telescopes, but even the supposed traditional telescope is no longer what, uh, what people think it, it used to be like. We have a picture of, uh, of a traditional, I guess, astronomer, a very famous astronomer that we wanted to take a look at. It's true. If you ask uh, most people to name an astronomer, <laughs> uh, some people might say Carl Sagan, but probably the other half of the population would say Edwin Hubble, because most people have heard of Hubble, and, and here he is. Uh, he died... Uh, almost 40 years ago now, but he was certainly the grandfather of many of the problems we're going to talk about today, cosmology, the large-scale structure and history of, of the universe. universe. Right. Uh, but the photograph is wonderful, isn't it? Just because it, it, uh, it meets, I think, every stereotype and preconception that people have of astronomers. Uh, uh, when I studied astronomy in college, I mean, we had a lab, and you would go to a telescope at night and look up into the sky. And I think my sort of my idea of what astronomy was locked into that particular phase of my life. Now, of course, it's, it's much different. It certainly is. Uh, uh, the, the photograph is nice because people love to see Mr. Hubble uh, gazing at the heavens and uh, contemplatively puffing on his pipe. <laughs> but uh, astronomy today is all done, first of all, with electronic light detectors that are controlled by computers. Most large telescopes have no eyepiece. There is no way to look through them, even if you wanted to. And so the image of the astronomer shivering in the, in the cold, dark dome is, is not correct. Uh, today's astronomer is uh, sitting inside, hitting enter on a computer keyboard all night, probably listening to rock music. Let me take a look at the, uh, the telescope of today. And it, uh, once again, it, it has a very famous name, probably one that people have seen and heard of uh, more than anything else, and that's the Hubble telescope. It's true. Mr. Uh, Mr. Hubble has contributed not only uh, his science, but also his name to this uh, splendid instrument of the 90s, launched in April 1990 and still circling the Earth once every 90 minutes, about 350 miles up, which we now call the Hubble Space Telescope. And of course, I was I was privileged to be involved in this project from the start. It's what what piece of that that's orbiting around uh, did you design? Well, behind the mirror are five different uh, electronic detectors that actually sense and analyze the light that the mirror focuses, and then radio those results to the ground for further analysis. And I'm a member of a team of uh, nine or ten different university astronomers spread across seven or eight different universities across the United States that designed one of those five instruments, in our case a spectrograph, which is an instrument that divides the incoming light into its component colors or wavelengths and lets you do a chemical analysis of the object that emitted the light. Our instrument was called the Faint Object Spectrograph and it's uh, 
served us faithfully for more than six <laughs> years, but is actually going to be removed from the telescope in the next routine servicing mission in February. Mm. Uh, the, the Hubble has taken pictures that we're going to see in, in uh, a few minutes. Some of them are quite familiar because they've gotten wide uh, play in the media. And it's easy to associate this burst of activity uh, and news about astronomy with solely with the Hubble. But there's a variety of sources for what we're seeing. Where, where are all of these images coming from, and why do they seem to be coming so thick and so fast? There has been a, an explosion of progress in the, recent, uh, in the recent decade, and it's not because astronomers have gotten smarter, of course. It's because <laughs> our tools have, have suddenly become much more powerful. There was a very long uh, sort of quiescent stretch when the famous Palomar 200-inch telescope in Southern California was uh, the largest instrument in the world bar none and totally monopolized observations in astronomy. Um, actually, it went into operation the year I was born and uh, remained essentially the only telescope available to the astronomical community of that size and capacity for almost 30 years. But what has happened in the last 10 years is that new technologies, both uh, computer technologies in design and fabrication technologies, new advances in optics, for example, and materials, have made it possible to make huge telescopes far more cheaply than that original behemoth. And <laughs> Now there are ground-based telescopes of comparable and more light-gathering power going into operation almost every year. And we're also relying more and more on observations of the universe at wavelengths other than visible light, wavelengths like radio or ultraviolet or X-ray. Some of them can only be done from space. In those cases, of course, until we could get up above the Earth's atmosphere with a substantial heavy piece of equipment, there was no chance to make these kind of observations. And so routine access to space is another thing that's change the picture, change the equation, and change the way we observe. Is it safe to say, I, I suspect it isn't, but if it isn't, you'll tell me that you're just going to get better pictures from space. I mean, there's a kind of logic about getting out of the atmosphere, getting out into space, give you better data. Is that, is it, is it always better from um, it's not always better from space, and it's a good question because uh, it's very expensive to go into space. There's some things, in fact, many things that are better done from the ground. The, the two techniques are, are complementary. Uh, one reason to go into space is if you want to take very sharp images. These days we don't say pictures anymore because they're not taken on film, but it's the same <laughs> idea. Uh, to get above the Earth's turbulent, frothy atmosphere Slush, does, does give you, that's right, does give <laughs> you the, uh, the ability to take very sharp pictures. But actually, it's the minority of astronomical observations these days that are done by taking images. Uh, much uh, of systematic astronomy these days is done through spectroscopy, as I mentioned, dividing the light into its colors and wavelengths. This actually lets you probe the atoms that reside in the object without ever getting there and touching them. Mm -hmm. But there are many problems in astronomy that just involve collecting a lot of light because you want to see something very, very faint, not necessarily at its ultimate sharpness. The Hubble Space Telescope is not a very large telescope. So if you want to look at something very faint, you want a huge light collecting bucket. And those type of instruments are still on the ground and probably always will be, mm. simply because it's so expensive to get things up into space. I've got a question about uh, how it collects the light, but uh, maybe we can talk about that as we take a look at a, at a few of the newer images that, uh, that we're getting a look at. And these are from the Hubble? Yes, I brought along a couple of images from Hubble just because they're so spectacular and well known to most people. Um, one involving the birth of stars. This is an image obtained by Hubble of a, a gaseous complex not that far away inside our own galaxy called the Eagle Nebula. It almost looks underwater. Yeah, many people uh, have seen it, of course, and it, there's a, th a very uh, three-dimensional ethereal quality mm -hmm. to it. Uh, this structure had previously been photographed from the ground many, many times, but the Hubble image uh, brings into focus uh, tremendous details that we've never seen. And at the scale of this photograph, it's a little hard to, to uh, notice, but in the bright edges, the kind of wispy things that are floating off of the top of these trunks, there are tiny little points of light, which Hubble is actually resolving for the first time. And, and these little points, sort of little tips to the candles, are new stars being born. They're just lighting off and will eventually float away from this birthing complex. What's the magnitude of what we're looking at? How big is it? Oh, this. Uh, the size of the image that we're seeing here is a substantial size of the full moon, so it's much, much larger than a single solar system, for mm. example. Um, we're seeing 
uh, many, many new solar systems being born simultaneously. Uh, star birth is a continuing process in our galaxy. Stars are born, they live for a long time, and they die. But uh, there are new generations being born all the time, uh, quite the same as human beings. Mm. We're going to take a look at uh, a couple of other slides that are, are companions of a sort. Um, let's take a look at the uh, I at brought the along first another one. set to illustrate now, rather than something nearby, something very far away, and Hubble's very peculiar uh, and wonderful ability to see things that are, are just not sharply focused from the ground. What we're seeing here is a, a small piece of sky, just a few percent the size of the full moon, that's been taken from a ground-based telescope, a traditional telescope, albeit a large one. And this little piece of sky was selected specifically because it's boring, because there's not <laughs> much there, nothing famous there, no particular action going on. And in a minute or two, we're going to see what Hubble sees when it has looked at the little area of the red box there. And you can see that the red box is particularly boring. It was selected <laughs> because there are just two or three uh, faint, uh, uninteresting objects as seen from the ground. Hubble was then pointed at this tiny little region for the longest continuous exposure that it has yet made. It actually took 10 days of continuously collecting and adding light. Without getting too technical, if it's not really film, when you're talking about a, an exposure, what is it, something is open, a lens is open? Well, a, a, uh, a protective cover is open, and the light is actually accumulated on something that's vaguely related to a television camera. After all, what is a TV camera other than something that turns incoming light into electrical impulses? And that is exactly the way that most of these instruments work. They turn incoming light into electrical impulses. And they use a light detection device that's familiar to most people through video cameras these days. It's called a charge couple device. So essentially, it's the miracle of silicon that everyone <laughs> hears about. So uh, this little chip of silicon, which actually only measures about an inch across, but is part of this whole 30,000-pound Hubble Space Telescope, was pointed at this one little swatch of sky for mm. 10 continuous days in a very long time exposure, the same way that you keep the shutter on your camera open for a very long time if you want to photograph mm. something faint. And the result is startling. Instead of seeing oh, this teeny little box with just three little images, that teeny little box, when observed by Hubble, uh, shows a, an incredible montage of objects. So remember, it almost looks like jewels in it, the it sky. It does, doesn't it? The and colors. Uh, are they really different colors? They, they are indeed, although the colors here are artificial. They've been, uh, an attempt has been made to approximate what you would see with your eye. Your eye turns out not to be a very good sorter of colors <laughs> anyway. Actually. So instead of just kind of three miscellaneous dots, we see uh, a field that is incredibly rich. This is, in fact, the faintest astronomical photograph ever taken by man. We're now seeing wisps of light fainter than anything ever seen. And almost every image here is, in fact, not a star inside our Milky Way, but rather a galaxy of 200 billion separate stars, all so close together that they're overexposed into each of these little smears. And almost every one of those images is a separate galaxy of 200 billion stars far, far beyond our own Milky Way. What was the reaction? in the scientific community in, in which you work when these images started coming back? Uh, interestingly enough, it was not even that obvious how sort of dense the final result would be. There was quite a bit of controversy. Everyone knew that instead of seeing three random boring things, one would see a, a far richer field. But the fact that essentially every little patch of sky is covered with a galaxy of 200 billion stars was not preordained and at least to some people was very surprising. I can't imagine anyone who can look at that picture and, and, and not marvel hmm. at the result. It seemed almost probably is as significant as some of the discoveries and revelations that astronomers in centuries past um, had. It, it changes the nature of the way we think about what's around us. It certainly put us in our place, let's, <laughs> let's put it that way. If we had any delusions of being an important corner of the universe, we can now very clearly see that's not the case. And that also seems to be a theme that runs throughout astronomy, that there's a, there's a, the more you know, there's a great deal of uh, humble pie that gets heaped along with it. Yeah, astronomy perhaps could be described as one continuous series of humbling experiences. <laughs> I'm interested in how people get access to the data that's being collected, sort of the, the astronomical infrastructure of, of this organization that you chair, um, and how those decisions are made about who gets to participate and who doesn't. 
The, uh, the time on the telescope, of course, is very precious, and uh, although it's an extremely sensitive instrument, there are only 24 hours in its day as well, and only 365 days in its year, so there's a very limited amount of observing time available on Hubble or on any of the big flagship instruments. And all of this uh, research time is allocated by uh, competitive proposals. That is, a scientist uh, who's interested in a certain problem uh, writes a document that describes the problem, describes why it's important, describes what the possible uh, uh, outcomes and corollaries of it might be, explains why, in the case of Hubble, that it can only be done from space, because that's very important. If you could do it from the ground, you should. And then once per year, an institute that is funded by the National Aeronautics and Space Administration uh, that's located in Baltimore, Maryland, called the Space Telescope Science Institute, solicits and collects these proposals. And they are then evaluated by a large panel of astronomical experts divided up into their little subdisciplines. Mm. And typically the situation is that uh, when the smoke clears and the panels <laughs> uh, have, said, uh, have said this is the most important proposal and this one is good but not quite so important, there is an oversubscription of about seven to one. That is six out of every seven proposals that are scientifically good and should be done to advance the field cannot be executed because there's not enough time on the telescope and that one lucky seventh proposal is the winner of the lottery and is selected to be executed. However, on a given day, Hubble is doing two or three of, of these different scientific projects and so in a year it might actually observe as many as a thousand different scientific projects for several different uh, several thousand different astronomers around the globe. So it's all a matter of how much hardware is available really to handle all of the ideas and the concepts that are being generated. There's certainly far more good ideas and far more good astronomers than there, uh, than there is time on the Hubble Space Telescope or for that matter time on any of the new large ground-based telescopes mm -hmm. as well. But one could argue that in some sense that's good and that it, it keeps us sharp. It, it uh, requires that the astronomer focus his or her ideas very, very carefully, make a very, very convincing case that this is the most important piece of science mm -hmm. to be done. But the whole process of how the field gets equipped, in a sense, uh, would seem from the outside to be uh, cumbersome, to say the least. I mean, you're dealing with large numbers of uh, government agencies, there's politics, uh, all of those things are all sort of roiled together with universities and research. Um, is that any way to, to, to run a scientific field? I wish life could be simpler. Um, <laughs> I, I would spend a lot less time uh, worrying about money for research. But the fact is that almost all of the important and interesting problems in physics, astrophysics included, are expensive now. And so this means that the taxpayer is going to be the only practical uh, person who can foot the bill. And uh, with this use of taxpayer's money comes the responsibility to convince the taxpayer that it's a good expenditure of, of his or her dollar. So the days when um, the, uh, the single astronomer sitting with a yellow pad of paper and a pencil and perhaps, and a pipe, and a pipe <laughs> thank you, right, and perhaps one assistant could uh, dream up an idea, sort of walk out into the backyard and solve an important problem, those days are over. And we, we can yearn for a return to that simplicity. But if we want to solve the important problems today, it's going to require these expensive facilities. We're going to talk about a, a couple of, uh, of interesting astronomical problems and, and puzzles that, that you're working on. Let's begin with, uh, go back to Hubble again, I guess, this whole matter of the expansion of the universe. And we've got some, some pictures we're going to look at as mm -hmm. we talk about this. Well, the, the basic uh, unit of matter in the universe, sort of the basic building block that uh, nature decided to, to put the universe together with is something called a galaxy. And uh, Hubble is in fact responsible for, among other achievements, understanding that. Uh, until he came along, it wasn't so obvious that everything one could see in a telescope was either part of our own island universe called the Milky Way or something external. But in fact, we now know that if we could get outside of our own Milky Way galaxy and look back, we'd see something like this, this grand spiral pinwheel. Again, we're looking at 200 billion separate stars all held together through their self-gravitation and so, so close together that it's hard to distinguish them individually in the photograph. And so you just see this grand pinwheel. And this galaxy, this association of 200 billion stars is 
the structural building block, as we take fainter and fainter and fainter images, we just see more and more and more of these things further and further away. The next uh, image is a slightly longer exposure of a small piece of sky, and now instead of just one cartwheel, one pinwheel galaxy, you see about 10. So each of the big uh, bright blobs is 200 billion stars trapped by their own self-gravitation. The individual dots, the individual stars that we see in the foreground are part of our own Milky Way. We have to look out through the trees to look beyond the forest. So those are foreground dots. And as we continue to take fainter and fainter pictures, we just see more and more galaxies. So here this, this so-called deep field obtained uh, with the Hubble telescope again. And, and now you begin to get the perspective that the further you look, the fainter you expose, the more and more galaxies we see. The contribution that Hubble made beyond understanding this unit of structure is that these galaxies are in motion. And in fact, in a very systematic motion, they are all moving away from us. Something set it in motion. Something set it in motion, although Hubble did not quite commit himself to, to what that was. But today, uh, we understand from a variety of different lines of evidence that it was a violent event that took a very early, dense, compact universe of individual atoms and set it flying apart. And of course, today we refer to this event as the Big Bang. One of the big questions in cosmology today in the study of the large-scale structure and history of the universe is, can you prove that it happened? It's pretty presumptuous to, to say that, that we know. And uh, how long ago did it happen? And it's one of the fabulous achievements of, of our generation of scientists that we have overcome both of those problems. We have extremely strong evidence that it really did happen, that the universe did begin with a Big Bang, and we know about how long ago it happened. But of course, in science, questions and answers only seem to lead to more questions, and there are, an there are no answers to the question of, will the universe continue to move outward, or will, all of a sudden, for some reason, like glaciers do, they contract again? We'd like to answer that question, of course. Uh, now that we know that the universe began with this, this violent explosion and is flying apart, uh, you'd like to understand whether we're doomed to have an extremely boring uh, neighborhood uh, about 10 billion years from now with nothing near to anything else, mm. or whether something could reverse that expansion. Although that might seem to be sort of the ultimately arrogant question to ask, we can at least understand how to probe it. We know uh, if the expansion will stop, what will stop it. The only force in the universe that's capable of re breaking and reversing the Hubble expansion is the force of gravity. Every atom in every star, in every galaxy in the universe is attracting every other atom in every galaxy in every other uh, uh, corner of the universe trying to break the Hubble expansion. Gravity is only an attractive force. There's no such thing as anti-gravity. Einstein explained why that is. And so actually, if we could count up the total amount of gravitational force in the universe, sort of take a census of how many atoms there are, we could ask, is there enough total gravitational tug to get the upper hand on the Hubble expansion or not. Rain everything and back if in. so, when? <laughs> and that question, will the Hubble expansion stop and reverse and turn into a contraction, is the center of a tremendous controversy in astronomy mm -hmm. today. Another controversy has to do with, uh, for want of a better phrase, it's called dark matter because it, you can't see it. It's true. We, we've made a... Uh, initial attempt at this census of matter in the universe, and of course, since we can't go out and actually touch and count every atom, the only matter that we can easily count is the matter that actually radiates light. When you count up the so-called luminous matter, matter that we can see because it makes starlight, you discover that you are far, far short of enough matter to reverse the Hubble expansion. In fact, it's not even close. For every 100 pounds of matter that you think you need to reverse the Hubble law, only about one pound is accounted for in matter that we can, can see in a census. But in the past 10 years or so, there has been a growing amount of evidence that there is matter exerting gravitational force around us, near us, possibly even with us in this room, <laughs> but does not generate light, is not luminous matter. Mm. And as a result, we call that matter dark matter. And aside from the intellectual curiosity of what can this be, 
it's clearly crucial to this issue of will the Hubble expansion ever stop or not. Let's take a quick look at a couple of uh, slides that you brought along. We can take a look at that illustrate this whole matter. Right. I'll, I'll give you an example of uh, why we think uh, this dark matter exists. Here's another galaxy of 200 billion stars, again like our Milky Way, if we uh, stepped outside. And these galaxies rotate like uh, pinwheels, in, in this case sort of in and out of the plane of our television set, just kind of slowly rotating around like a frisbee. We can actually measure that rotation rate. It's very slow. It's an imperceptible motion in a human lifetime. It takes about 200 million years to make one turn, but we have more devious ways of making <laughs> this measurement. And uh, it turns out that they are spinning around reasonably rapidly. And of course, when, you, when, you, uh, when a fluid spins around, there's a force that pushes things towards the outside. If you turn a corner rapidly in your car, you're, you're forced to the outside of the turn. If your sailboat force. makes a turn quickly, you, you, you lean the opposite way because of centrifugal force, right? And so there's a force acting to actually spray the material out of these rotating galaxies, and yet they are not disrupted. As we take these gorgeous pictures through the universe, we see that these galaxies hold themselves together. They must be holding themselves together through the gravitational force. It's the only force that we know of in the universe that is strong enough over large enough ranges. So we can actually work backwards and calculate how much matter must be in each galaxy to keep it from coming apart under this rotation. Mm -hmm. And the answer is very startling. The answer seems to be that they have a hundred times as much matter in them as we see radiating starlight. To create this balance between rotation and centrifugal force, most of the matter in the galaxy must not be visible. And this is one of several different independent lines of evidence that make us believe that the universe is full of this dark stuff, this dark matter. We have so little time left. I, I, you raised a point earlier about the public's involvement in this. A lot of this seems very, it's very heady. Um, how do people get a toehold into it, into understanding? this kind of information that the, you, you're steeped in and you understand it so well. Well, to, to use a popular phrase, uh, astronomy is actually not rocket science. <laughs> um, astronomy has a tremendous advantage over many other fields of physics and the physical sciences in that everyone, if they think about it a little bit, is actually interested in astronomy. Everyone since the caveman has gone outside at night, looked up, said, gee, that's pretty. I wonder how far away they are. I wonder how they were made. I wonder if we were made the same way. So. Uh, astronomy is not a hard sell. There is an intrinsic an uh, interest in everyone in astronomy, and the questions that the person in the street asks are actually the important questions in astronomy. How old is the universe? How did it start? How will it end? It's just, of course, that, that the working physicist attacks them at a, a far more detailed level. Hmm. Wonderful. Well, I want to thank you so much for being a guest uh, on Upon Reflection. Maybe, I, I don't know if the answers will be found to some of the bigger questions that were raised in this interview, but if they are, please come back and talk again. It's my pleasure. To see more UWTV classics, visit uwtv.org slash classics.